Hi again, I want to talk to you today about proof that there is no seven-year tribulation. The idea of the seven-year tribulation is based on teachings that are not biblical. They're just plain not biblical. Uh, it's based on a misinterpretation of Daniel chapter 9. If we look at Daniel chapter 9, we can see the truth about what Daniel's 70th week really is. Look at Daniel chapter 9 and we start at verse 24. It says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city. So this is 70 weeks that are determined upon Israel and Judah, the people of Daniel, because he's talking to Daniel. His people are Israel and Judah. 70 weeks are determined upon Israel and Judah and upon thy holy city, that's Jerusalem, to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring everlasting righteousness, and to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The first thing we can see is that things that happen during these 70 weeks of years include the finishing of transgression. Well, Obviously, the finishing of transgression was done by Jesus Christ. He rid us of transgression by canceling the law and taking up the sins of the whole world. So Jesus finished transgression, and I've done multiple videos on how Jesus did this. He finished transgression once and for all because he took the sins of the world on himself and he canceled the law. So Jesus finished transgression during his ministry. So his ministry is part of the 70 weeks of years. Jesus' ministry has to be part of the 70 weeks of years. Because Jesus finished transgression. He made an end to sins. Jesus did this. And he made reconciliation for iniquity. There's no doubt about the fact that Jesus did all this during his ministry. When he died on the cross and rose from the dead, Jesus put a finish to transgression. He made an end of sins and he made reconciliation for iniquity. Jesus did this. It's past. It's done. This is not a future thing. This is something that has already happened and it happened during Jesus' ministry. Jesus also brought in everlasting righteousness. We see in Romans chapter 3, there's righteousness from God apart from law that has been revealed. And that is through faith in Jesus Christ. So Jesus also brought in everlasting righteousness. So all these things here, finishing transgression, making end of sins, reconciliation for iniquity, and the bringing in of everlasting righteousness, this was all done by Jesus Christ during his ministry. So part of the 70 weeks, no doubt, has to be Jesus' ministry. If we look at verse 25, it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, at 69 weeks, and the street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublous times. So 69 weeks, this is talking about, that will pass from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. So Messiah the Prince obviously is Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ came after 69 weeks of years following the command to the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Now, we know from history that this is 457 B.C. No, it's not 445. There's some people who say it's 445 B.C. No, 12 years earlier than that, in 457 B.C., that's when the or going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem went out from our tax receipts. So that is actually 457 B.C. That's when the the commandment went, went forth to restore and build Jerusalem. This is not the temple. This is Jerusalem, not the temple. So that's 457 B.C. So 457 B.C. plus 483 years would bring us to 27 A.D., which happens to be the exact year Jesus began his ministry. So Messiah the Prince, his ministry began in 27 A.D. exactly when it says here. In other words, the first 69 weeks of years, the seven weeks and the three score and two weeks, that's 69 weeks, that passed. We know from 457 until 27 AD when Messiah the Prince, his ministry began in 27 AD. That was exactly this time period. That was exactly to the year, to the very year. That was 69 weeks of years, 483 years. So that went right up to Jesus' ministry. And then it says after the three score and two weeks, which is after the seven weeks, it says the seven weeks and three score and two weeks. So it's after all 69 weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now it says after 
after this time period, after the 69 weeks, shall Messiah be cut off. So sometime after Jesus' ministry began, Messiah would be cut off. Yes, he was. Three and a half years into his ministry, he was. But not for himself. That was no, it wasn't for himself. It was for all the people of the world. Jesus took the sins of the world, according to 1 John 2. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And of course, they did that in 70 A.D. And the end shall come with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So this is telling us an overall view here. After the three score and two weeks, Messiah will be cut off. Yes, he was three and a half years after that 69 weeks of years. Not for himself, but for the sins of the world. He took the sins of the world. He was not cut off for himself. No, he did it for us. And the people, the prince that shall come is the Roman Empire. Obviously, the Roman Empire, they came along and they, they destroyed the city and the sanctuary uh, in 70 AD. And so that all came to pass. But then it says in verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And many, many say, oh, that's the Antichrist. Well, that's a ridiculous misinterpretation because there's no possible way this could be talking about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is never mentioned in any of this. Verse 26 says, it says, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. So we have a pronoun pointing to Messiah as being the subject in verse 26. So Messiah is the subject. And then it says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So the, the prince that shall come is, is the Antichrist, and he's never mentioned. The prince that shall come is never mentioned. It says, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And they did. That was the Roman Empire. That wasn't the Antichrist. That was the Roman Empire. That was the people. The people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And who's the subject of this, this uh, whole verse 26? Messiah. Messiah shall be cut off. Not for himself. He's the only person mentioned in, in a, a pronoun here. Himself is referring to Messiah. Messiah is the subject. The pronoun himself points to Messiah. So the three after the three score and two weeks, after the full 69 weeks, Messiah was cut off. Yes, he was. We know he died on the cross three and a half years after his ministry began in 27 AD. Not for himself, but for us. And the people of the prince that shall come, they destroyed the city and the sanctuary. There's no mention made of the Antichrist here. It says the people of the prince that shall come. That's talking about the Roman Empire. They came and they destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And then people go to verse 27. They say, he shall confirm the covenant. Oh, that must be the Antichrist. No, there's no chance. There's zero chance this is talking about the Antichrist. Zero, none. There's no chance. There is no pronoun. There's no subject pointing to the Antichrist here that this pronoun could mean the Antichrist. This pronoun is pointing to the subject, which would be the Messiah. We see in verse 26, after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. He's the only person mentioned in verse 26. And the himself is a pronoun pointing to Messiah. And the people, and this is plural, the people of the prince that shall come is talking about a plural people. It's not talking about the prince that shall come. No, he's never mentioned in person. The people of the prince that shall come, come and destroy the city and the sanctuary. And that's in 70 AD. And so verse 27, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week is obviously talking about the Messiah who is cut off, not for himself. So himself and he are pronouns pointing to Messiah, the subject Messiah. So verse 27, he, Messiah, shall confirm the covenant, not a covenant, the covenant with many for one week. Is this just with Israel? No, it's with many Jesus took the sins of the whole world. This is the covenant in Jesus' blood. Jesus, the Messiah, confirmed the covenant with many for one week. Jesus' ministry began in 27 AD. And the first three and a half years of his ministry, what did he do? He preached the kingdom of God. He started to confirm the covenant with many. He did this during his ministry for three and a half years until he died on the cross. So he confirmed the covenant with many for one week. That's the length of the covenant, one week. The first three and a half years were Jesus' ministry. The last three and a half years are the three and a half years of the two witnesses who are Israel and Judah. So obviously all 70 weeks of years are for Israel and Judah. They're not for Christians. 
We saw in verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. That's Israel and Judah, not Christians. No mention of Christians here. Thy people, talking to Daniel, that would be Israel and Judah. And it even says, upon your holy city, talking about Jerusalem, making it extra clear that these people are Israel and Judah, because the holy city is Jerusalem. So it's as plain as dear day here that he, G, the Messiah, Jesus Christ, he confirmed the covenant with many for one week. We know that the rapture happens and then the last three and a half years uh, start. And that's the last, there's only three and a half years left of Daniel's 70th week. There's only three and a half years. This verse 27 makes it absolutely clear. It says, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Now remember, who is this talking about? Jesus Christ is the, the pronoun here is talking to himself, Messiah. Messiah, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week, he, Messiah, shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. Well, did he do that? Wouldn't you know, Jesus caused all sacrifice and oblation to cease three and a half years into his ministry, in the midst of the week. What's three and a half years into seven years? That's the middle. Three and a half years in, in the midst of the week, Jesus caused sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate. So in other words, Jesus made the sacrifice and oblation desolate. What is he talking about here? He shall make it. What is he talking about? Sacrifice and oblation. The subject here is in the midst of the week, he, Messiah, shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading abominations, he shall make it. What's it referring to? The sacrifice and oblation. For the overspreading of abominations, he shall make the sacrifice and oblation desolate. In other words, meaningless. The, the sacrifice and oblation was continued on by the priests in the Levitical priesthood after Jesus died on the cross three and a half years into his ministry. They continued until the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. The sacrifices were made all the way up until the temple was destroyed. So Jesus caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease in the midst of the week, when three and a half years into his ministry, he died on the cross and he caused sacrifice and oblation to cease. In other words, they no longer existed. They were not legitimate anymore. They ceased. They ceased to exist. There was no longer a reason for them because Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins. And if you read in Hebrews, it explains all about that, how how there's no need for any sacrifice in the New Testament. So as soon as Jesus died and rose again, that was it. There was no more sacrifice and oblation. It was done away with. And in the midst of the week, three and a half years into Jesus' ministry, he caused that to happen. He caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, in other words, it was an abomination that the priests continued to do the sacrifices because it says, for the overspreading of abominations, Messiah shall make it desolate. He made the sacrifice and oblation desolate. So he made it, it tells us right here, he made it desolate. In other words, the fact that they continued to do the sacrifices was an overspreading of abominations. It says, for the overspreading of abominations. In other words, it was an abomination that the priests... Levitical priesthood continued to do the sacrifices. That was an abomination, and Jesus made it desolate. He made the sacrifice and oblation desolate, even until the consummation. What's the consummation? The destruction of the city and the sanctuary. That's the consummation here, even until the consummation. Well, wouldn't you know, the sacrifice and oblation was done by the priests until Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. And wouldn't you know, it says here that over, for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. And that's when the sacrifice stopped being made. So it's obviously talking about the sacrifice and oblation because he shall make it, the sacrifice and oblation, desolate, and he shall do it even until the consummation, the destruction of Jerusalem and in, in the temple in 70 AD. And then it says, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Well, who would the desolate be? Well, what was made desolate? He shall make it desolate is talking about the sacrifice and oblation. So who are the desolate? Those who are making the sacrifices after Jesus died and rose from the dead. That determined shall be poured upon the desolate. That would be talking about the Jews who did not recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah and what happened. Obviously, they lost Jerusalem. Jerusalem was destroyed and the temple was destroyed.
so that is mentioned in the previous verse where it says they shall destroy the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end shall come with the flood and on to the end of the war desolations are determined so there are, were all kinds of desolations that happened during this war and in the end at the consummation of it Jerusalem and the temple. The temple was destroyed and Jerusalem was, was destroyed. It was overtaken by the people of the prince that shall come. They destroyed the city and the sanctuary. And that's the Roman Empire. So we have all kinds of crazy interpretations of this exact verse, this exact verse, verse 27 of Daniel chapter 9, where the people try to say, oh, this is talking about a future uh, covenant that is made with the Antichrist. No, nope. nope, not true. Not true. There's only three and a half years left of Daniel's 70 weeks of years, and the Bible plainly tells us that in Revelation. In Revelation, there's only three and a half years covered after the rapture. If we look at Revelation chapter 6, it tells us at the rapture in verse 12, it says, I beheld and he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. When does that happen? At the rapture. And the stars of heaven, heaven fell to the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs, figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. The heaven departed as a scroll when it, when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. We know this is not talking about the day of the Lord, because on the day of the Lord, the mountains ceased to exist altogether. Here, they're just moved out of their places. And in fact, the kings of the earth and the rich men and the great men and the chief captains, they hid they hid themselves in the dens and rocks of the mountains. In other words, the mountains were still there. So this is obviously the rapture this is talking about. Is not the day of the Lord, could not possibly be the day of the Lord because the mountains are there and they're hiding in them. Why are they hiding? Because Jesus Christ returned. Because it says, they say to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from who? The face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of who? The Lamb. Lamb, Jesus Christ. Why are they hiding in the rocks of the mountains? They, they see the Lamb coming down from heaven. It says, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Why him who sits on the throne? Because the firmament is taken away. It says the heaven departed as a scroll when it was rolled together. What's the heaven? Genesis tells us the heaven is the firmament. That's the firmament that's that keeps us from seeing the temple of God that is above the firmament. And of course, once the heaven departed like a scroll, when it's rolled together, you could see the temple of God. And so they're saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. Where's the throne? It's in God's temple, which is above the firmament. Well, the firmament's gone now. The heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together. The firmament's gone now. And you can see the temple of God. And so they're saying, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Because they think the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Well, in a way it has, because the rapture starts the last three and a half years before the day of the Lord. And this is all extremely clear if you read the book of Revelation. I've done many studies on this. I've made videos about this, and you can go and see any of those. But just to make it extra clear that this is talking about the rapture, let's just go back quick to Matthew 24. Let's look at verse 27, talking about the rapture as the lightning comes out of the east and even unto the west shines. So shall be the coming, also the coming of the Son of Man. This is the rapture for wherever the carcasses are, the eagles will be gathered together. The eagles are the believers and we're gathered to Christ at the rapture. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. So here's the tribulation of those days. And that notice that happens before the rapture. There are times of tribulation before the rapture happens, and it's not seven years. It never mentions seven years. There's no mention of seven years before the rapture happens. There's no seven-year tribulation mentioned anywhere in the Bible that is made up by people who misinterpret Daniel chapter 9. So it says immediately after the tribulation of those days, there's lots of tribulation before the rapture happens. What shall happen? The sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. Wouldn't you know that's what Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 said. And the stars shall fall from heaven. Whoa, whoa, whoa. hold on a second. Didn't, they, didn't Revelation 6 12 just say the stars would fall from heaven? And then it says this, then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. And the tribes of the earth shall mourn. Wait, isn't that exactly what we just read in Revelation 6, 12? 
The people are hiding in the caves and rocks of the mountains, saying, Hide us from the, him who sits on the throne from the wrath of the Lamb, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather his elect together from the four winds from one end of the heaven to the other. So notice this is the rapture he's talking about. He gathers together his elect. He doesn't come down to Jerusalem to reign. No, that doesn't happen here at the rapture. That happens on the day of the Lord, which is three and a half years after the rapture. So, I mean, I've made numerous videos about this, and I've explained this in great detail already many times over. So I'm not going to be a broken record here and just tell you the exact same things I've told you in all the other videos I've made. But it's just very obvious here that in Revelation chapter 6, Starting at verse 12, this is talking about the rapture. The sixth seal is the rapture. What happens? The stars of heaven fell to the earth. That's exactly what Jesus just told us in Matthew 24. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. That means that the temple was visible. And of course, for the last three and a half years, the temple is visible in heaven. We see that it is visible later on in Revelation. So the people are saying, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. In other words, they see Jesus coming with the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And what happens in verse seven? What happens in chapter seven? Wouldn't you know, in chapter seven, after the sealing of the 144,000, which are the two witnesses, verse nine says, After this, I behold a great multitude which no one could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the lamb well hold on the lamb is in heaven he's not down in jerusalem reigning on earth he's in heaven this is right after chapter 6 verse 12 where we saw the rapture happen right after that the lamb's in heaven he stood before the throne and before the lamb the lamb's in heaven he's not in jerusalem reigning he's in heaven and who are these people? These are all the Christians who just got raptured. Behold, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, not Jews, all nations, all kindreds, peoples, and tongues. They stood before the throne, before the Lamb. They're in heaven. They just got raptured. They're clothed in white robes, and they have palms in their hands. And this told to us who these people are. One of the elders asked and said, Who are these who are raved in white robes? And whence came they? And I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Remember, there's great tribulation that happens before the rapture. No seven-year tribulation. It doesn't say seven years. It doesn't say they came out of a seven-year tribulation. It says they came out of great tribulation. Just like Jesus said, there would be tribulation before the rapture happened. So here we see these are they that came out of tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb? These are Christians that just got raptured. These are Christians. This is the rapture that just happened. These are now before the throne of God, and they serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. They are now with the Lord in heaven. Jesus did not go down to reign in Jerusalem. No, that doesn't happen yet. There's still three and a half years after chapter 7. We saw in chapter 7 that in verse 1, the first thing that happens right after the rapture is the 144,000 are sealed. Wouldn't you know the 144,000, the two witnesses, have a three and a half year ministry. It says in chapter 11, in verse 3, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy how long? A thousand two hundred and three score days. How long is that? That's three and a half years clothed in sackcloth. Three and a half years is what the two witnesses have right after the rapture. Right after the rapture, the two witnesses, the 144,000, they have a three and a half year ministry, 1,203 score days. And this is the two witnesses, the 144,000 who just got sealed when the rapture happened. If you watch my video on the two witnesses, I explained that the two witnesses are the 144,000. There's no doubt about this. It's just absolute fact. And notice that when they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit shall make war with them and shall overcome them and kill them when they're done with their ministry, which is 1,203 score days, which is just barely under three and a half years. And then after the, they rise up, these 144,000 rise up from the dead after three days and a half. The spirit of life from God entered them and they stood up to their feet and 
they heard a great voice from heaven saying, come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud while their enemies looked down. That's 144,000. The same hour, there was a great earthquake. A tenth part of the city fell. And it says the second woe is past. Behold, the third woe comes quickly. And what is the third woe? The day of the Lord. What happens right after the three and a half year ministry of the 144,000 ends? That begins right after the rapture. What happens right after that? The seventh angel sounds his trumpet. And what happens? And there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. What's that? The day of the Lord. The 144,000, the two witnesses finish their ministry, and then what happens? The second woe is passed at that point, and the third woe comes quickly right after it. The seventh angel sounds his trumpet right after the 144,000, the two witnesses end their three and a half year ministry. The seventh angel sounds his trumpet and the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever. And the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats, they fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which are and was and are to come because you have taken your great power and have reigned. In other words, he's starting to reign right now. This is the day of the Lord. The nations were angry and your wrath is come. This is the day of the Lord. The time of the dead that they shall be judged. When is that? That's the day of the Lord. And thou should give reward to thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy them which would destroy the earth. When does that happen? The day of the Lord. Read Revelation 19. When does this happen? The day of the Lord. And the temple of God was open in heaven, wouldn't you know? The temple of God is visible. Just like we saw that the firmament was removed when the rapture happened. And for three and a half years, the temple of God is visible. How would you know the temple of God was open in heaven unless it was visible? There was seen in his temple. Was seen in his temple. In other words, the temple is visible. The temple of God was open in heaven. And the reason you know that is because it was seen in his temple, the Ark of his Testament. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. And all this happens on the day of the Lord. And of course, chapter 12 starts over with a second testimony of the, the time starting with Jesus' ministry and going through until the day of the Lord in chapter 19. Chapter 11 is the end of the first account. And so we see that there's exactly three and a half years. There are three and a half years left of the 70 weeks of years of Daniel, and they're all for Israel and Judah. They're not for Christians. Notice the two witnesses, the 144,000, are what? They're from the tribes of Israel. They're, they are Jews. The 144,000 are Jews. It's told us plainly the two witnesses are Israel and Judah, and they are from Israel the 12 tribes of Israel. It tells us plainly right there in Revelation chapter 7. So we know that their ministry is three and a half years long and right when it ends, the day of the Lord happens. So we know there's only three and a half years left of Daniel's 70 weeks of years, which means there is no seven-year tribulation. That whole idea of a seven-year tribulation is utter baloney. It is not biblical. It's not true. It just is not factual. And if you watch the rest of my videos on the end times, I explain this in great detail. But this is just an overview that just makes it clear that there's no chance. There's not a single chance that there's a seven-year tribulation. It's not possible. If you believe the Bible, then you don't believe there's a seven-year tribulation because they can't. there can't be a seven-year tribulation if the Bible is true. There's no possibility of it. It can't be true. So that's my message for today. Thanks for watching.